I'm Lon. I work at Retail Me Not. We are a uh, savings destination for consumers to find uh, different ways to save on things. Um, and specifically, I focus on the website and on building frameworks and tooling. Um, and I'm also responsible for the performance of the website, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And so in that role, I end up doing a lot of performance experimentation because you want to you know, make sure that the thing that you're going to do is actually going to make the website faster. Um, and I'm going to talk about the approach that I take uh, and specifically how to be um, rigorous so that you have like a clear and formal process that you follow when you're doing your experiments, uh, how to have your experiments be reproducible so that other folks who want to try and do the same things that you've done can uh, achieve the same results. And finally, and this is kind of the tricky bit, uh, wrap it so, so that your performance uh, experiments have uh, like a tight iteration loop and you're able to figure out what's going to work and what isn't very quickly. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, motivate the talk a little bit um, by asking sort of like, so why do we care about performance? You know, like, you don't want to just like optimize for the heck of it. I mean, it's fun, but it's not necessarily going to be driving the business results that you care about. And you really want to ground these performance, uh, the performance work that you do in terms of uh, the user's experience and the business um, that you happen to be working for. Um, we're going to be talking about page load performance today, and so I'm going to motivate why page load performance of websites matters. Um, and the first reason is that users care. Um, there are tons and tons of studies out there that show that users are happier and do more of the things that we want them to do on our websites when that website is fast. Um, but there was recently a really awesome study uh, conducted by a company called Sawasta, which is now a part of Akamai. And what they were able to do is aggregate a whole bunch of real user measurements from across the entire web, just millions and millions and millions of measurements. Um, and they aggregated those together, and they found some interesting stuff that confirmed a lot of sort of smaller experiments that have been done in the past. Um, and the first thing that they found is that users buy more stuff if your site is faster. Um, so they saw with a one second slower um, page load, a 20% drop off in conversion. So that means that users aren't buying things, they're not downloading whatever it is you want them to download, they're not using your site in the way you would want them to use it. The next thing they found is that users don't stick around if your site's slow. They bounce, they leave. Um, and an increase of one second in page load speed actually resulted in a 50% increase in bounce rate. So these are users that you never even have a chance to try and, uh, and interact with. Um, they're never gonna see your content, they're not gonna buy anything from you, they're not gonna look at your ads because your website took too long and so they left. And finally, um, and this one actually kind of surprised me when I first read it, which is that users interact more with faster sites, meaning in this specific case that they navigate deeper into your website, they look at more pages. And at first I was like, I don't know why that would be, but in fact, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if the page loads faster, then it takes less time, the user can go to the next page. So um, what they actually found is that a one second increase in page speed meant that users had 25% shorter, um, uh, excuse me, um, journeys into websites. Basically, like they viewed 25% fewer uh, pages during their session. And that all translates into fewer opportunities to convert, um, fewer ads you can show the user. Um, and a lower likelihood that they're going to become a, a repeat visitor, a loyal user. So the next reason is that Google cares. Um, and some of y'all may be familiar with how Google has recently pivoted their entire developer relations team to shaming the builders of slow websites on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but in fact, they've cared about it for a long time. Um, they first announced the page speed uh, score as a ranking factor in their algorithm seven years ago in 2010. Um, and they recently announced something sort of even more interesting. Um, Google doesn't talk a whole lot about how the Googlebot works, but they did recently say that if your site is faster, they will crawl it more frequently. And this is important because the results on Google can only be as fresh as the last time that they crawled your site. So if they crawl your site more often, they'll get to see more content, and you'll have more opportunities to, to kind of give the Googlebot what it wants, which is nice, fresh content. So uh, before we move any further, I want to talk about sort of some key terms um, and concepts that won't take too long. Um, a lot of times we think about performance just in terms of speed, right? When someone says performance, you think, OK, make something faster. But I did want to point out that there's other kinds of performance to think about. There's um, battery life, for example. Um, you want to try not to drain the user's battery on a mobile device. Um, and also memory usage. If you, you know, you're using lots and lots of memory, then that can be a problem. Um, so sort of more broadly, 
Um, performance and performance optimization in particular is the sort of practice of figuring out how to minimize the number of resources that you consume to accomplish a task. Um, in our case, that task is going to be to transmit a web page to a user and show it in their browser. Uh, one thing that will often come up in this sort of context is that you'll have to do trade-offs. So a great example of this is a content feed on a site like Twitter or Facebook. Um, the user wants fresh content, but they also don't want their battery to get drained. And every time you go out to, the, to your servers to fetch more content to show the users, that wakes up the radio, which uses up the battery. And so you have to figure out how to balance these two constraints in order to achieve the best experience. In computer science and software engineering, you're, you're mostly going to be interested in the, um, the in sort of time and space, basically how long does it take to do something. Um, and how much uh, memory usage or disk space that I have to use up in order to do this calculation. And a lot of times you can trade these two things off. Today, we, like I said before, we'll be talking about um, uh, speed, time. Um, and specifically, we're going to be thinking about it in two ways. There's latency. Latency is the time it takes to achieve a particular task, so from start to finish. Um, and I want to contrast that with uh, throughput. So throughput is how many of these tasks can you do at the same time? The analogy that I like to draw is, um, say you're going to move. So you've got all your stuff packed up in the boxes. Well, if you have way more boxes than will fit in the pickup truck, you're going to have to do more than one trip. This is not that big a deal if you're moving across town, right? You just drive over, unload it, come back. We've all done this, maybe. Um, this is a bummer if you're moving to Chicago, because you're going to have to drive all the way to Chicago, un unload your load, drive all the way back to Omaha, and load up another load. So you really want a bigger truck. Um, and the reason that I make this point is because for page load performance, particularly in, in the mobile age, latency is the only thing that matters. Because uh, the round trip time from the user's device to your server is going to be the dominant factor in how long it takes to load the web page. Um, so today we're going to be thinking about render latency, meaning um, how long does it take from the time the user starts to navigate until the actual site is painted on the, on the page. And the reason we care about that um, is because that's what the users actually experience. Um, so OK, we got some key terms. Now we're going to talk about how do we actually go about doing an experiment. And the basics are something that you all are probably familiar with from um, sort of high school or middle school science, which is the scientific method. So you have a question, do heavier objects fall faster? You have a hypothesis, no, gravity works the same for everything regardless of its weight. And so you try and test this out by making two balls, one of them heavier than the other, but they're the same size. And you drop them off of something really tall, like a leaning tower. And you measure how long it takes for both of them to fall. And at the end, you say, ah, oh, they fell at the same rate. Cool, my, my hypothesis is confirmed. In, in the world of performance experimentation, you end up with something closer to this. It's the same idea, but it's sort of expanded a little bit. And what you want to do is you want to figure out what you're going to measure. Um, and so you identify some metrics, and then you need to take baselines. You need to see where you're at right now, uh, decide where you want to get, try some different things, see where that got you, and you repeat until you reach your goal. Um, I'm going to use, as a motivating example, um, the React to-do MVC app. Um, Sarah talked a little bit about some of the problems with this uh, particular project in, uh, in her talk. I don't want the takeaway to be, oh, React is slow. Um, that's not the case. Um, the these, uh, this site is like, or this project rather, is intended as a sort of exercise for people to learn and be able to compare different frameworks. So they're not optimized, which is really great for my use case because it makes it easier for me to find things to make faster. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our metrics of interest. Um, and in our case, we have two. The first one is called um, first paint, and this basically measures the time from the user beginning to navigate until something is painted on the screen, anything at all. And specifically painted above the fold. I mean, you may hear me say that a few times. So that, ju that just means the content that is visible before anybody scrolls. Um, and I picked this over other metrics you all might be familiar with, like load, uh, the load event or DOM content loaded, because the user doesn't experience those. They don't like, know when the load event has happened, but they know when stuff paints. And so the other thing that we care about is, or are going to measure is visually complete. How long did it take to finish rendering the above the fold content? So basically, like we're going to measure how long does it take to start painting, and how long does it take until we're finished painting? Um, and so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to we got to measure the baselines, right? We need to figure out like 
where are we at right now so that we know how far we got to go. Um, and so what I like to use for this, um, particularly for just like first ad hoc looks, is the Chrome DevTools network tab. Um, you can click this uh, blue camera icon on the right, left side of the screen, and that'll actually uh, set it up so that the next time you reload the page, Chrome will capture a um, film strip, which is a screenshot. Every time something paints, they take a screenshot, and so you can see all of the times that, you're, that something was painted by the browser and when. Um, and so that allows us to see that, um, in this case, uh, it's a little hard to see, but at 2.95 seconds was the first actual paint, and that was, so, so that's our first paint, and at 5.19 seconds, uh, the browser was done, so that's visually complete. Now, when you do these measurements, you want to be sure that you do them in a way that is um, realistic. So um, in, in this case, I turn off the cache because for consumer-facing websites like Retail Me Not, um, almost all of our users have a cold cache. They haven't been to our site recently enough in order to have our stuff cached. Um, and so we optimize for that case. Um, it, it, in your case, if you have a lot of re frequent repeat visitors, then you might want to optimize for the, cold, uh, for the warm cache case. Um, and then the super important thing to do is to throttle your network, which is um, on the right-hand side there, because um, you'll typically be doing development over Wi-Fi on a laptop um, with a great broadband connection. That's not how your users are usually going to experience your website. They'll be connecting over mobile. They'll be using a mobile device. Um, so we got our setup, and we basically reload the page a few times. Um, you want to do multiple measurements, because every time you, you take a measurement, you know, the, the data may take a different path through the network, so you can't really be sure that um, you're really getting a, a, an accurate picture. So you want to capture maybe five to seven times, uh, more if the data is particularly noisy. And this quickly gets kind of, you know, like tedious to do all this refreshing, and then you got to, like, write it down or put it in an Excel spreadsheet. And so there's actually another great tool called Web Page Test. Um, and Web Page Test allows you to plug in a URL and set up a sort of configuration of what browser you want and what network conditions, and then it will run the same test over and over again a configurable number of times, and then give you a really great report of um, basically uh, how you did or how the site did. And so on web page test, you do the same thing. You set up a custom connection. You set the, uh, the throttling that you want, how many times you want to run the test. Um, in the middle is the equivalent of the disable cache. So you can either capture the first view or the first view and a repeat view. And we're only interested in the first view in this case. And finally, the most important part, if you're going to do any sort of render uh, testing, is to turn on the capture video flag so that web page test will actually capture a video of screenshots during the page load. And so once it's done doing all its runs, it takes you to a page like this. It's really uh, interesting looking and has lots of things on it. Um, I want to call y'all's attention to uh, this little link at the very bottom there. It says plot full results. If you click that, it'll take you to a page where you can actually see all of the various metrics that are collected, plotted, and some nice summary statistics about those metrics. Um, and this is super nice because uh, we, uh, we want to actually look at the median in this case, not the mean. Um, and this is an important thing to note. In, um, when you're doing performance testing, it's often the case that the mean is not going to, the mean or average is not going to be that useful. Because that really only helps if, you're, if your data is normally distributed, like a bell curve. A lot of times, performance data is not, in fact, normally distributed, particularly if it's collected from real users. So we're going to look at the median. All right. So the next step is to set a goal. Um, our goal is going to be to improve the time until we finish rendering the website without starting to render the website later. In other words, we want to make the website finish rendering faster, but we don't want to delay the start of render because that's an important signal to the user that the, that the website's going to paint. And if you regress your start of render, you're often going to end up with users that bounce. Um, so we took some, some baselines for those metrics. Uh, and now I move on to identifying an optimization. And this is where things really do start to get tricky, because there's like a ton of different things you can do. There's all these blog posts saying, load your fonts this way, load your fonts that way. Um, don't use fonts, use fonts. Um, for some reason, people are obsessed with fonts. Um, so a good one to use is called PageSpeed Insights. Um, this is a great uh, Google-provided tool where you plug in a URL, and it will, and you click this Analyze button, and Google will download that website a couple times, once in a mobile uh, version, once in a desktop uh, view. And then it will sort of check for best practices using a bunch of 
heuristics, things like, did you set good cache headers? Are you optimizing your images? Did you minify your JavaScript? And at the end, they'll spit out a score. You can see that 2 of VC doesn't really do very well with a score of 60. Um, that's not part of my slides. Uh, and then um, also it'll, more importantly, give you a list of different optimizations to try. Um, but recently there's a new tool that's come out and that's super exciting, and it's called Lighthouse. You all may have heard about it in, in the context of these uh, fancy progressive web app thingies. Um, but it also has a really great performance audit um, that covers a lot of the same ground as PageSpeed. Um, and what's really nice is that it, since it's built into the dev tools, uh, you can run it against your local environment. For PageSpeed Insights, you have to actually have a publicly accessible URL that you can plug in, and this thing you can run against you know, something running on localhost or in your test environment or whatever. Um, and that is in Chrome Canary now and will be in the next, uh, the next major version of Chrome. So both these tools are just doing a thing called removing or, uh, or inlining render blocking CSS. So let's try that. Uh, but what is that? So when a browser renders a web page, it sort of reads it from top to bottom. And when it encounters a link tag that references a, a style sheet, it has to stop because that style sheet is going to affect the look and feel of everything below it. It might move things around, change their colors. It can totally change what the browser is going to be doing. And so the browser doesn't want to waste a bunch of time laying out and painting something when it might just all get changed by the style sheet. The bummer about a style sheet that's referenced from a link tag is that the browser has to make a network request. And so in this case, uh, with Todo MVC, there's a one kilobyte CSS file that can take, sometimes in this particular time, took one second to download. That's like 1992 dial-up speed. So we have like delayed the page load completely by one second because of this one little CSS file. And so the, um, the inline CSS optimization, oops, oh wait, yeah, sorry. Okay, so the basic idea of the inline CSS optimization is take those, um, take the actual, uh, the contents of the style sheet, put them in a style tag directly in the HTML, and then the browser doesn't have to make that extra round trip out to the server to fetch the styles. So how do we, how do we actually implement that? Um, it gets a little complicated because, so, so the, the first part's easy, right? You just like drop in the, uh, the, the, you place the link tag with the contents of the style sheet, you like look it up on the disk. Um, but then you also want to uh, go ahead and re-download the style sheet, which seems a little weird. But the reason you do that is so that it'll be in the browser's cache. Because if the style sheet is cached, then you actually want to do the original setup because it'll have the contents right away. So now we're going to move on to implementing it. And this is where things get even trickier. Um, it's, straight, like, it's very straightforward to do in to do MVC. You like, find that file on the disk. You go and you edit the HTML, and you drop it in there. No problem. But then you, at a minimum, in order to run it against something like web page test or page speed, you're going to have to find a place to host it. Um, and for, for a production website, this sort of optimization is actually, can actually be a lot harder. Um, you may not control the code that injects the um, CSS, right? Sometimes different teams own different parts of a particular website. Um, you may not even work for the company that is uh, building this website. And you may be trying to figure out how to make some third-party content faster, or you may be work, you know, brought in as a consultant. And so um, you end up having to spend a lot of time trying to get the thing done. And then what can be a real bummer is that sometimes it doesn't work. You, know? you try this particular optimization, uh, and, and instead of making things faster, it can sometimes make things slower. Um, and so what you'd really like to be able to do is just like try the, uh, try the end result out. And so. I ran into this a lot of times, and so I did what engineers often do, and I, I built myself a janky tool. And the way this thing works is um, you can capture what's called a HAR, an HTTP archive. So an HTTP archive basically records how a page load happened. It, it, it writes down all of the requests that went out, like all their headers, which resources they asked for, and then it also records the actual responses, the headers of those responses. Most importantly, it, it records the payloads puts them all in a JSON file, and you can get this thing from the network tab of your Chrome browser. And so what I built is a tool that allows you to take one of these HARs and just replay it at will. So you can make the same page load happen, meaning the exact same, um, 
the exact same responses, even for things like ads. So if you, you know, have found like a, uh, that on one page there's this ad that's slowing you down, uh, you can capture that and actually replay it. You can replay it under different network conditions, um, which allows you to test like how does this same thing, the exact same thing, perform under say broadband versus 3G versus 4G. Um, but more interestingly for our purposes, you can edit the HAR. And so the HAR is just a JSON blob. And so we can do that same change that we talked about earlier. We can edit the, um, the HTML in the HAR and replace the style link tag with the style tag in the contents of the CSS. Um, so Groundhog Day, uh, and so you end up with this workflow where you capture a HAR and you update it, you edit it, try different things, and you play it back and see right away whether the thing worked or not and how well it worked. Um, Groundhard Day ships with headless Chrome. It's, it's a, it, Groundhard Day is actually a, a VM, uh, and it's open source on, on uh, the Retail Me Not Sandbox GitHub site. Um, and so in there you can run headless Chrome, you can like, actually like, do all that sort of testing. And it's possible, although very difficult, to run web page tests locally. And so you can, if you do that, if you go through all those steps, it took me about a day, um, you can connect a local web page test instance to the Groundhard Day VM and actually do the whole thing yourself. And so what happens when, when you send Chrome to a website, the headless Chrome inside the VM, when it requests, say, um, uh, google.com uh, that's been captured, it doesn't go to the network. It just replays it inside the VM, and we get to control all of how that works in terms of the network conditions and that sort of thing. And so um, now we're going to measure the results. So I actually made this change myself inside the HAR, and I took some measurements. And what we found is that the time to visually complete actually went, uh, dropped by 200 milliseconds, which is awesome. Um, and if you think about it, this actually makes sense because that's about the round trip time that, um, of, of the particular network conditions that I had. Um, and so the, now the question is, did we regress the, the so, we, so we're definitely finished rendering faster. Um, did we start rendering? Uh, and we actually ended up starting rendering faster. So we achieved both of our goals. We finished rendering much more quickly, uh, and we didn't start rendering later. And so now you come to the last part of the process, which is to basically repeat until you get to wherever it is that you're trying to go. Um, and so uh, hopefully I have set up for you all sort of a process that you might be able to apply to performance experiments that you run into in the future. Um, and I would if you end up doing performance experiments, I super duper hope that you all check out Groundhog Day. It's, um, like I said, a little bit janky, but I'm going to continue working on it and improving it and hopefully put like a nice interface in front of it. Um, and I would love any help with that you all want to give. Um, and with that, I'll say thanks. I really appreciate it.